Bine v-am găsit, dragi telespectatori! Suntem din nou față în față. Astăzi, împreună cu mine, am un invitat special, o emisiune deosebită, deoarece avem cu noi un tânăr pe nume Louis Trâncă Pasat, care a fost jucător de fotbal american. Interviul vom face în limba engleză, deoarece Louis vorbește mult mai bine limba engleză, deși înțelege foarte bine ce spun acum. Și probabil că și poate spune câteva cuvinte în limba română. N-am să-l forțez, deoarece uh, vrem să ne comunice clar ceea ce Dumnezeu i-a pus pe inimă. Ai înțeles ce am spus? Da. <laughs> deci știm sigur că știi să spui cel puțin da. Bine ai venit la emisiunea noastră. Uh, thanks for uh, accepting my invitation. I, uh, I was um, impressed by your uh, testimony. Just one phrase that impressed me to call you to be here today was... I believe God called me to serve him. That's what you said in a, in a church uh, prayer uh, meeting where you shared a little bit about your um, trip to Philippines. We'll talk about that uh, more. But before we get there, tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, you were born here in the United States. Um, tell me about your, uh, a little bit about your youth, uh, your childhood. Yeah, I was, uh, I was born here in the United States, in Chicago, born and raised um christian family i have two older brothers two older sisters you know my parents escaped uh, communism in romania came here to let us have a better life and you know went to church every sunday um life wasn't always easy we we had seven of us living in a one bedroom apartment um for the majority of my life um went to school I loved to compete. I always noticed I, I loved uh, I loved football. Uh, I think since I was four years old, I remember watching the NFL uh, in my living room. I would always be excited to get back home from church in between churches and to turn on a TV and watch and play with a football in my hands and pretend I'm making the, the game-winning catch. And uh, um, you know, I, I always loved sports. I always competed, and I noticed around sixth, seventh grade, I really wanted to play, and that's where my passion kind of started for for football. Well, that's the, 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 the theme of this uh, conversation. Uh, I want your testimony, but I want to know how you went from passion to purpose. Because uh, you just shared that early on in your life, you discovered the passion for sports, and specifically for uh, football. Tell me a little bit about your uh, uh, childhood. You grew up in the church. How was that about? I'd like to, to learn about your your spiritual basis. Uh, you were raised in a Christian family. You went to church. How was that? Were you always a fan of going to church? So, if I'm being honest, I mean, I went to church because my parents went, and they, they, you know, they led us there. So did I. A lot of times, I didn't know why I was there. A lot of times, I wanted to play with my toys, not really listen to the sermon. Um, And a lot of times I didn't want to go. Uh, I remember even, especially Monday nights, we would have prayer night and my dad and mom would, would say, let's go and kind of force us to, to go. And I would be like, oh, I got to go again. And I don't really want to go. And, you know, I was, I was almost doing it to please them instead of pleasing God or searching for God. And um, my, my relationship grew with God um, and I was always faithful. I, I believed in him and you know, just from growing up in a church and, and listening to, to sermons. And uh, around 13, 14 years old, uh, there, used, there was, uh, in, during the summer, when we had summer breaks, we would have prayer uh, weeks during the summer. We would go every day and pray. And uh, I remember, it was about when I was 13 years old. I don't have an exact, I don't remember my exact age, but I remember I was, I was, we were praying for the gift of speaking in tongues. And I remember God blessed me with that gift. And uh, in 2005, uh, September 7, uh, September 11, uh, 2005, I, I got baptized in, in, in the water. And uh, that's when I gave my life, to, my life to Christ. And I knew that I wanted to follow him. Um, 
but I didn't know at the time my purpose. I just knew my passion was football, and I knew that this is what I kind of had to do growing up was believe in Jesus, um, go to church, pray, and get baptized. How was that uh, different after you get bap- got bap- baptized? Uh, was your going to church or your relationship w- uh, with God different in any way? <sighs> I think I matured a little bit. I think I kind of understood the importance of following Christ. Um, I knew that what I, what I learned most was I, I believed that I was going to follow him the rest of my life. Now, I didn't know fully understand why I was doing this. I, I was almost like tradition. So I just did it because other people did it. Um, I know when I had gotten gift of speaking in tongues, I know when people got that gift, then traditionally they would get baptized right after. And that's what I kind of did. Um, and I don't think at the time I fully understood um, why I was doing it. I just kind of did it for, for tradition in a sense. So when did you actually discover that uh, your relationship with God started to take form? My relationship with God started to take form, and I, it was the first time when he spoke to me. And it was um, junior year in high school. I was about 17 years old, and I had started to, I was, I started to have some success in football. I uh, started to get multitude of scholarships from across the country, full rides to attend universities to play football. And it was obviously a big deal. Um, you know, it was uh, my parents initially weren't fully in agreement with it because of just the traditional ways of just, oh, you have to go to church at school and no sp- sports is kind of like bad. And uh, I remember one night I had really liked the University of Iowa. They offered me a full scholarship and I went to the visit, my, well, my family, we all really liked it, and there was rumors of the head coach leaving the program. And that was what was keeping me uh, from committing there. That was, I was doubting again, and I wasn't sure. And I remember one night, I got on my knees, and I, I, I remember I really prayed. I was like, God, this is a big decision in my life. Um, I know, you know, he kind of was guiding me, and uh, I, I was like, show me where to go. And the next morning, I remember waking up, going straight to the TV, turning on ESPN. And at the bottom of the ticker, I remember reading, uh, Iowa head coach gets a five-year contract extension. And to me, I got goosebumps. And I remember I ran and I told my mom, I ran in the kitchen, I told my mom that, and I, that was the first time I felt like God had listened and really spoke to me. That's when I really, he was kind of directing my path. And I knew in that moment, that's where I was going to go. I was going to go to school, the University of Iowa. Did you? Yeah, I knew in that moment. And uh No doubt, no doubt in my mind. So you went there, you went to that school. So how was it there? I went to University of Iowa, uh, 2010. I graduated high school early. So initially, I was, you know, I was supposed to graduate in June of 2010 from high school, but I graduated in December of 2009. And I joined college right away. I didn't have no summer break. I didn't have tr- the normal transition uh, that a, a normal student does have through the summer and visiting the campus and all that. It was hard. Uh, it was the first two years at Iowa were two of the hardest years of my life. I was a 18 year old kid that had left home for the first time in my life. Um, I grew up in my family, grew up around them, always leaned on them for wisdom and knowledge. And now I left to a, a location I didn't really know and people I didn't really know. And it wasn't easy. I was a kind of a big fish in a small pond in high school. And now I was a little fish in a big pond when I got to college and I, I I was kind of like shell-shocked and uh, didn't really know many people, didn't know, you know, where to go to church there, didn't really, you know, kind of get plugged in. And I started to slowly uh, kind of get depressed. Um, we, had, we had, you know, a coach there, a, a, a position coach that would just break you down. He would never really encourage you. And Uh, it was tough, and especially going there as a small kid and, and trying to get stronger, and I was going against these better players, and I was getting beat up every day, every day, and I was alone a lot I, uh, because um, I didn't want to really associate myself with parties. I never drank in my life, and that was one thing I always kind of held on to. I'm never going to do that, and um, I didn't want to do things that weren't obviously right in God's eyes, and a lot of times that caused me to be alone. Um, in my dorm room, uh, didn't go out. I would just watch TV. I would, and really, I was dead, I'd be depressed. Um, 
And in 2011, December of 2011, I, I thought about quitting. That's when I was, you know, I, I remember I called my dad and I told him, you know, this, this isn't for me. I, I don't know if I can do this. And I remember he said, he's like, what are you going to do the rest of your life? Are you going to, you're going to end up working at McDonald's? He's like, I can't pay for your college. And uh, I remember I told my head coach that I thought about quitting and uh, he gave me a couple of days off. And this was the second time in my life God had spoken to me. And this is where I, I believed he was directing me. And, you know, my, my prayers, and it, I was praying throughout these two years to God as well. And through the struggles and through the depression and through the silence, again, I was just, God, like, somehow, some way, make this position coach that I didn't like. And it was very tough with him. And there was a lot of people that, that struggled with him. Uh, make him disappear somehow. Make him leave. You know, I didn't know if it was possible. I didn't want to quit. I love the game of football, and that's what I knew life, that's what, that's what I had passion about. And, and so I came back after that break, and one of my teammates uh, comes running up to me. He goes, Lewis, guess what? And I, I was like, well, what's up? And he said, the position coach, he left. He transferred to a different school. And that's where I just felt the weight of the, of the world off my shoulders, and I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I was shocked, and I was just like, thank you, Jesus. Like, he's gone, and, and you know, and then after that, that's when my career took off. I ended up having the three best years of my life, and I ended up, you know, being encouraged, worked hard, focused, and I, and I ended up starting the last three years at Iowa. Let's talk about your passion for, for, for the sport, for football. Um, you discovered that early on. Um, what do you think caused you to have that passion to play? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I thought about that, and I think it was the competition between my brothers and I. I had two older brothers. We would always compete in everything, and mainly sports, and they were always better, better than me. I'd always get beat up by them. Uh, I was always smaller than them, and I loved f the physicality of just football. We played tackle football in our front yard, you know, on cement, and I loved the physicality of the game. I, I know my my parents and my older brothers and sisters always told me as a little two, three-year-old kid, I would run and just throw myself on the ground, and I would get up and I wouldn't even be hurt. So, and I noticed in school, throughout elementary school, I had I was always I don't want to, I'm not bragging, but I was always, I had better physical uh, abilities than my, my peers. And so, you know, and I loved the game of football. I just loved the physicality of it. And I just felt like that, you know, that's how my passion started to grow for the game. Were you ever concerned about the danger of the sport? Never. Never thought about it. I was never, never now, thought about it. Now, we're talking about American football. Now, Romanians, uh, for the most part, they, they know soccer. Yeah. But the American football is not very popular, as you probably know, in, in Europe, in Romania. Now, right. this appears to us like a, like a physical fight more than, <laughs> than, a, than a game. So how is it? I mean, uh, is it, uh, was it very difficult for you? Um, it, was, it was, the training was difficult, going to practice was difficult. The, the, those are the things that weren't fun, you know, the dedicated hours, the sacrifice not being uh, around my friends while they were at the park playing in the summer, I had to go to practice, go home and sleep and make sure I got my rest for the next day of practice. And then being away, obviously, from home, that was hard. That was the, sacri the sacrifice of practice. That wasn't fun. Um, but the games, competing and, and imposing your own will on somebody was, was exciting. It was exhilarating. And it made you feel uh, good. Tell me the truth. What was it? Was it the passion or the potential to make a lot of money? What, was, what were you really looking after, uh, you know, as you were progressing, you know, and, 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 uh, and getting involved in more and more into the sport? You know, it was funny. Um, growing up and playing in high school and, and college, it was, it was passion driven. It really was. I never did it for the money. I never thought about you know, the money at the time, I just loved the game. I you knew I was good at it. And through how God kind of directed me and kept me where, I, where he kept me, I felt that this was my calling. This is what he wanted me to do. And as I got to the NFL, you know, I noticed that my opportunity was maybe not as, not as bright or the future wasn't as bright or I didn't have that much opportunity there. And so I really started to think about, okay, like how can I prolong my career here to try to make as much money as I can? And that's when my focus started to shift towards, I want to try to make as much money as possible in a short amount of time so that I can retire young. 
So tell me uh, about that process. Uh, how did you uh, end up being uh, selected to play in, the, in a team, especially for NFL? Yeah, so my last year uh, in college, I had my best year. I was really focused, and my goal was to make it to the NFL. Played well enough. I got a couple invitations to uh, a bowl game, you know, with an uh, individual bowl game where some of the best players around the country go and play against each other, and I got invited to the NFL Combine. And, you know, I, I did perform well enough. And um, I remember draft day, I uh, was with my family, I was at my sister's house, and we were all waiting, and I was waiting, you know, for, an, for my name to be called. I remember my agent told me I was projected to go in the fourth, fifth round. So my hopes were high, I was just waiting, you know, for my name to be called, and it never got called. Uh, the seventh round ended, and my agent said, hey, look, there's teams interested in you, and after the draft is over, there's also an undrafted period where, where guys go undrafted, and teams, you get to kind of pick where you want to go, and... We thought the best thing in the Rams were the one team to offer me an opportunity, and we thought that would be the best spot for me to go based on the scheme and all of that. And uh, you know, and that's where I ended up decided to go. Uh, the, and they also uh, they had the you know it was the, kind of the closest thing to home too for me, and I felt comfortable with it. And my family, we all just they were excited. And meanwhile, in my heart though, I was kind of I was kind of upset. I was upset that I didn't get drafted. I felt like I I earned it and my my stats showed it and uh you know i was a little down about that and but then the rams gave me an opportunity let's talk about that opportunity how did that uh, turn out it was a so my rookie year 2015 um it seemed the nfl actually was easier to me because iowa they prepared us so well it was so difficult that almost the training we did there was easier and I was having a really good rookie year, uh, rookie year really uh, throughout camp. Um, they would throw me in practice. They would give me m way more reps than more of the players, and they would do that on purpose to see if you can handle the pressure. And I was performing well. I performed well in the preseason. Now, come cut day, I did get cut, but I remember they brought me back, and they wanted to sign me to the practice squad. Uh, for those that don't really know, there's usually 10 guys on a practice squad, and they're just on the team, but they don't play. They just practice, and they do have an opportunity to get moved up to the active roster in the future to play. So I was ecstatic. I was like, thank God, you know, I, I'm on the practice squad. I still have an opportunity. Again, I was motivated. I was like, all right, let's go. And um, I, I, during the preseason, I had the best stats out of – all the defense I performed the best and as a defensive tackle that's pretty hard to do and again I was thinking I'm going to make the roster and I didn't and I got cut again I was like okay I'm down you know I made the practice squad okay I'm going to think positively and and so did well and towards the end of my rookie year uh, uh, I remember the the at the time the San Diego Chargers wanted to sign me they wanted to take me off the Rams practice squad and sign me to their team but the Rams said, we'll move you up to the active roster and we want to keep you. And so I agreed. I wanted to stay with them. And so they moved me up to the act active roster. I didn't play. I just I went to the games. I was in uniform. I never I never played. The following year, you know, I was promised by the coaches, you know, keep doing what you're doing, work hard, and you're going to you're going to make a you're going to have a spot on the depth chart and play next year. Had a great offseason, put in a lot of work, again, sacrifice everything. And in uh, June uh, 7 of 2016, I remember I was at practice, um, normal play, ran through the line, I just got pushed in the back, planted, and I heard a pop in my knee. Continued to practice, no pain. I was kind of worried, but I, you know, I finished practice. I remember telling the coaches, uh, the training staff, you know, I feel look, my knee feels a little loose. They did test and they found out I had torn my ACL, and uh, I was devastated. I, I I I was devastated, but again, being a competitor, I was like, I'm gonna come back stronger from this, and I'm gonna put in more work, and I did. I came back stronger. I had um, a great. Uh, in the following off season, I had a great off season. Come preseason 2017, comes cut day, and again I was projected to make the roster. And the cut day comes and it passes, and I'm on the team. And 
I'm like, thank God, you know, it's, it's one of the most stressful times in, in for, for, for an NFL player because guys' lives change. They don't know if they're going to be on a, on a roster or they're going to not have a job. So I'm thinking, thank God I made the team. I'm relieved. My family stressed. We're all happy. And next, uh, I remember the next uh, hour or so after we had practiced, I, I got a call from my agent and he told me that they're going to cut me. But they promised they're going to be bring me back in a practice squad. So frustrated, I was like, okay, you know, practice squad again. That's that's fine. I'm still here. Uh, signed a practice squad contract. I go. I sign a lease uh, for my apartment. And then an hour later, after that, I get a call, and they told me I got cut from. They're going to have to let me go from the practice squad because they have to bring somebody else in. Numbers game, politics, devastated. I already had all my things kind of packed in my car. I ended up saying, appreciating for the opportunity. I ended up driving 32 hours straight from, um, from Los Angeles to Chicago. And uh, I had, uh, you know, one more opportunity or, or practice with the Detroit Lions, an opportunity to try to make the team. That never evolved into anything. And um, as time kind of went on, I stood training for a year after, after 2017 to stay in shape and kept praying and hoping for opportunity and uh, yeah as days went by days became weeks weeks became months and you know I finally got that call from my agent and, and he's like you know I this is probably you know no team was going to give me an opportunity anymore as younger guys that come in and uh, that was it that was that was that was my career I didn't have a choice I didn't I didn't you know have a say in that it. That must have been uh, some kind of a um, turning point for you. So I'd like to talk about that after we take this break. What happened next? Because I think that when you go through all that, you know, up and down, up and down, and now down again, that must have had uh, uh, an emotional toll and not only just an emotional toll on you. Uh, we'll be right back. We're back. Um, I uh, have with me today Luis Trinca Passat uh, um, with a very powerful testimony about his passion for the sport. And uh, towards the end of the program, we're going to talk about your purpose after all this, all these experiences. So, how did you feel after all those ups and downs, going through all those um, uh, times of, of uh, hopeful? Um, you know, potential for the future. You, you, you could have been an NFL player earning a lot of money, and um, that could have been, you know, a very, very good situation for you. It didn't happen. How did that affect you? Um, so after that kind of ended, you know, part of me felt relieved, but deep down inside I was really, it was really hurt because I, I felt God had directed me. I, I felt that was my my. I thought that was my purpose I, from God. He, why did he bring me to Iowa? Why did he answer my prayer there? Why did he keep me at Iowa? Why did he let me have all that su success and then bring me to the NFL? And uh, I fell into a really great, you know, I was great depression. I was really depressed. I, um, and it wasn't easy. I, what most people can't relate to in, in, in life is the life of a football player. And what I try to help to help people understand, what I try to tell them is, um, let's say you're, you feel like you had a passion to be a, a doctor. You do that your whole life, and then someone tells you, hey, we're going to let you go. You can't be a doctor the rest of your life anymore. You, you, you didn't do anything wrong. You just, eh, you're just not good enough, so we're just going to have to let you go. 
that's it, go figure out a new career. After all that time, you know, years of school, years of everything, and it just ends abruptly. So that's what a life of NFL player is. You, we put, we invest more than half my life into it, and then to know that it just, it's done, uh, I had lost, I felt like I had lost my identity. And your passion, because you enjoyed to do that, and your potential for your future uh, was diminished uh, in an, you know, quickly. Uh, so how did you manage that time uh, of dry season? Um, it was tough. It was tough. I, uh, I remember, you know, 2017 at the end there, towards the end of the year, I was, you know, depressed. And, and, and in entering 2018, um, I said, you know what, I, I, I want to read the Bible from the beginning to the end. Um, because I was trying, I was praying to God and I, I wanted His direction again. I, I wanted... Um, him to direct me because I didn't know what to do next in life. I, you know, I was lost essentially. So in that time I said, okay, in 2018, I'm going to read the Bible every single day from beginning to end. And I had finally, I accomplished that. I never did it my whole life. You know, it took me 27 years to do it and I had done it. And throughout that time, and I'm not saying this to, to brag, but, or boast, but I would be in my room a lot. Um, no, it's really emotional for me, but um, I was alone a lot, and uh, I didn't go, you know, praying in church to show everybody who I am, and I'm praying. I uh, I would pray alone in my room, and uh, it was just me and God, me and God, and I would pray the same prayer every night. God, show me what to do next in my life. Show me, um, give me a career, a passion uh, for something that I had playing football. Um, and I know I want to I do this, and I want to start it, and I want to finish it. And I don't want to do anything else. I, want, I just want to stick with one thing. I hate starting something and quitting. And that's what I would pray uh, every day. And there was nothing but silence. And uh, I would go to church, nothing but silence. I started to fast, nothing but silence. And you know, I was like, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing all this, and I'm not hearing anything from God. You know, the Bible says, seek Him, and you know, He will guide your path. He will seek first His kingdom, and He, you know, He'll give you all these things. And I wasn't getting anything. I was just getting the silence, and uh, my frustration grew with Him. Um, and I became, I was, you know, I, I became really depressed, really dark pl place, and I started to question um, my my existence. Why I'm on this earth? I remember I was, just, I got to a point on my, my birthday, uh, you know, of uh, this uh, September seventh, two thousand eighteen, and and nineteen, and I just kind of asked God, you know, what's my point? What's what's my purpose in this earth? I feel like Nobody cares for me. I feel like um, I don't have a purpose anymore. I I lost my passion for to do anything. I I didn't I didn't want to do anything. I just was depressed. I would sleep, stay home, and sleep all day, and I would uh, look for other things to kind of fill that void in my heart. And uh, it weren't good things either. It was it was um, it was just things of the world and um you know that's when a lot of it and that's where god was started to work in my life and i remember in 2019 uh the beginning of 2019 i said let me try real estate school um i had two degrees uh, from the university of iowa and i was I remember i started applying for jobs and i had a bachelor's and a master's degree and nothing i was the doors were just getting shut um I couldn't even find a job to make $35,000. I was getting, having interviews, I was getting denied. I was not being accepted. I was just like devastated. So I said, let me go to real estate school. I know I can study, get my license. And again, I was like, this is something I can make a lot of money in and try to make what I, what I would have made playing football. So that was kind of like, that was, I thought my, my, you know, that was, that was my motivation. And so I got my license and um, that's what I did during that time. How did that work for you? So, I did it for, I still have my license, and I, I did it for a short period of time. 
and uh, I just knew that this is something that I wasn't going to wasn't going to do long term and I was still praying every night again um, and for God to show me you know a direction I just you know I, again I did this I got this job I just got it to do something to show the world to show my parents to make them proud that I'm doing something that I'm not being lazy and uh, you know and and but I knew this just it didn't it didn't like drive me it didn't give me a purpose you know I felt empty and uh in November 15 of 2019 um that's when God really spoke to me in my life and that was one of the most powerful moments in my life and uh if you want to keep you want me to continue I, I'd like to ask you first what were you praying for during that time of uh Silence. You were praying, you were fasting, you were trying to seek God's direction. Were you praying for something specific? What were you hoping? Two things I was praying for constantly. One was for God to give me a direction in life, to help me find a job, a career that I would enjoy doing as much as I did playing football. And the second one was, you know, I, I, was, I was tired of being alone. I, I prayed, you know, God... Give me a wife. I want to have a family. You know, I, that's that's a dream of mine. And and these things I felt were biblical because I was they they are in the Bible. And I was asking God for direction, and I, I wanted Him to lead me because I know many times in my life where I did things without His will, I got hurt, and I hurt other people, and other people got hurt, and so I didn't want to do that anymore. And that was my prayer, consistent prayer, and it was just nothing but silence and. I guess my frustration grew with God, and I started to grow really frustrated with God. So what did you do when you reached that point where you realized, hey, I'm praying, I'm trying to do the right things, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do something useful uh, that's, that's beneficial, and, and also you know, having a partner um, was uh, important to you, and nothing was happening. Did you ever date? Um... Yeah, I had you know I had some past relationships, but during that time I didn't you know I I, I didn't do anything. I was literally just me and God. Um, and what I had realized during that time was that um, that I grew with God, and I was actually getting closer to Him without realizing it. You know, I was getting closer to Him, and He was getting closer to me. And when you're in that moment of depression, of silence of pain and frustration and questioning God's will in, for your life, you don't realize, I didn't realize that I was getting closer to Him. And uh, I just continued to pray. I just continued to pray. Um, and I got to a point where I said, God, this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm done praying to you. I'm, 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 this is, you're obviously not answering my prayers. It's been... You know, I went through my injury since 2016, and 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 some you know some some other problems, and it just wasn't. You weren't answering me, and I just said, you know, this is God. This is like I'm I'm done praying. I think this is you know I'm I'm frustrated with you, and I was like I'm gonna show my frustration with you by not praying anymore and by not wanting to go to church and to show him like who's you know I'm the boss. I'm gonna show you. So what happened? <laughs> and. Uh, so November of 2019, November 15, um, it was the Romanian uh, pastor conference at Philadelphia Romanian Church of God where I attend. And uh, I didn't want to go to church that day. I, 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 my frustration grew and, um, you know, I, I was just like, I'm just going to go. Uh, I rejoined the band and I was kind of keeping, I was just go for the band, play a little band. And, and uh, play the trumpet, and, and that was, you know, that was pretty much it. And um, that night, I went back to church again, not wanting to go, um, but I was just like, okay, I'll just go, frustrated. And Pastor uh, Tony Lane was, was, was there, and he was, he was going to preach. And I remember sitting, I remember standing, actually, we were singing and praying, and I was mad. I was like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm pissed off at you. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to sing. Why should I? You haven't answered me. Um, I've been doing that all this time, and you're not answering my prayers. So 
I'm, I'm, I'm just going to sit here. I'm, I'm going to show you that I'm frustrated. I'm gonna, I want you to see how frustrated I am in this moment. And I was like thinking, I was like, I almost wanted God to speak to me that night. I was like, I, it's like, I was like, say something to me, God. Like, I, I like, look at me, how frustrated I am. I didn't tell, you know, Pastor Tony Lane, I don't, he knows of me. I knew of him at the time. I didn't have a relationship with him. Didn't tell him none of this. Didn't tell him nothing I was going through in my life. And before he um, preaches, um, I remember he turns to me in front of the congregation and he goes, uh, Lewis, God gave me a, a word for you tonight. And he said, just wait. He said, for he sees the desires of your heart, but he's working his plan. Just wait. And um, the emotion I feel now is the exact emotion I felt in that moment. I felt overwhelmed. I felt loved. And I finally heard and I knew he was listening. And those words were enough for me to hear. I, I, I just, I knew, and it applied because I had been waiting so long. And he knew my frustration, but he, has, he was working his plan. And he told me to just wait. And it, it made sense to me. And it might have not made sense to other people around. And there were other witnesses, you know, that I had shared my, my struggles with throughout my time. But, and they were kind of my witnesses. And... And, and that happened that night, and, uh, you know, that was, again, kind of the turning point in my life uh, where, where God started to, started to speak to me, and that night, Pastor Tony also had an altar call, and um, the altar call was who was willing to, to go up to the altar and, and, and accept the mantle from God and, and serve Him and give up, and basically serve Him, give up their life to serve Him. And I remember praying. I was really emotional. I remember just, I was in constant and deep prayer, and I felt it tugging on my heart. I felt the Holy Spirit tugging on my heart, go up there, go up there. And he kept waiting. And, he, you know, people, a few people went up there, and he said, is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? And I just felt like, I felt like, God, if you call me by name again, I will go up there. And he didn't. There was nothing but silence, but it was a waiting period. And I knew... I was, I was scared to go up there. I knew I wasn't ready to go up there, and I didn't. I didn't walk up. I, I wasn't ready to accept what God was calling me to do in that moment. Why were you scared? Uh, you had that experience. Uh, it's interesting because God called you by name, which is unusual. Not, uh, it doesn't happen often. And even after that, um, you didn't have enough courage. What do you think it was that held you back? You had some doubts. You still needed time to kind of process what was going on. What did you feel at that moment? There were two things I felt in that moment. One was I was scared. Um, I, I knew he was calling me, uh, starting to call me. I was just, I just couldn't accept giving up my life to serve him. Uh, and, and that was one thing. And the second thing was, it was more from a um, church standpoint. And basically, I didn't want to feel like this the whole service was about me. Like God had that word for, for Pastor Tony to me. And I didn't want to like go up there and almost make it look like a show, like, oh, this is something about me. So... I just, that's what kind of held me back. I, I didn't want it, I, that's what, and that's what just, and those were the two reasons why I didn't walk up there in that time. So, what happened after? How did that, did your life change in any way after that experience? There was a uh, great change. And um, now I'll go back to, and I was, I was in good spirits. And um, I remember I was at a, uh, I was at a friend's party, and um, it was there. They were revealing whether they were having a, a a boy or a girl. And after the party ended, there was someone that I didn't know um, and, and personally, and uh, they they made a comment to me about my past, um, about my past relationship, and uh, it devastated me. It really frustrated me. I actually I never had gotten so angry in a while I can remember in my life. Um, 
and I, I went home. I remember I took it out of my parents. I started yelling at them. I started arguing with them. I said, why is this person bringing up my past? I've been trying to let go of this. I've been trying to focus on God. And um, I just felt like I was being judged again. And um, I was in a dark hole again. I felt like the devil kind of attacked me in that moment. Um, and it was Christmas Day. And I wasn't about to go to church again. I went. Then I went back home. I didn't go to no parties. I was really depressed. Um, and I wanted almost people to feel my pain. And I, by not showing up to parties, my family's parties, I felt that they can relate or feel my pain. And so three days later, my brother uh, came over to visit me. He was worried, concerned, and we had a really long conversation. It was three in the morning. We were talking and... Uh, he mentions, I don't remember the whole conversation, but I don't think one thing he mentioned, and it was, he's like, hey, man, with all this time that you have trying to figure out your life, why don't you just go on a missionary trip since you have the time? And it really stuck with me. It really it just, for some reason, impacted my heart. I felt that feeling again tugging at my heart. I didn't tell him. I just thought about it, you know, and we ended that conversation. I remember praying that night, and... I had that overwhelming feeling again. I started crying. I started praying to God. I had the overwhelming feeling again when I had at the altar call. And I said, God, I'm going to listen to you this time. And so I was like, I'm going to go on a missionary trip. I feel like that's, that's what I'm just going to do. I don't know why, but I want to do that. And so the only person I could think of and I felt really drawn to was Pastor Tony Lane. Uh, I, because I, one, because I known he, he does missionary trips and I just felt drawn to him for some reason. Like I had to reach out to him and I felt comfortable sharing my testimony, everything that I had gone through my past, exposing that, uh, and being vulnerable. I felt comfortable telling him because it's almost like he, he kind of had an unbiased opinion and didn't know me well. So, um, I didn't have his email. I didn't have his phone number, but I had his Facebook. I was uh, Facebook friends. And so I think three, three something in the morning, I remember um, messaging him and, and asking him for his email. And I'm like, I'm praying. I'm like, I hope he responds back somehow. But it's three in the morning, probably not. Because in that moment, I was really feeling like I wanted to share my, my testimony with him. And I remember like in a split second, he writes his email. And I'm like, I see it. I'm like, <laughs> wow. Uh, I was like, okay. So I sat down at that computer that night and I just sent him an email um, um, about everything that I had gone through. Um, you know, I, I, I could pull it out and share with you right now, but most of it I've shared, um, you know, obviously with my, with my past and everything that I had gone through. And I remember saying in the email, and I had written it, that I, I'm, I don't know why I'm doing this. Um, I'm scared. Uh, I, I'm, I don't know why I'm scared. This doesn't make sense to me. Why I'm sharing this, my testimony with you. Why I'm telling you my personal past, what I've gone through. Um, I remember I wrote it I, I, in parentheses, my thoughts that I was like, I feel like deleting this email right now. I feel like just stopping at this. To me, this sounds crazy. Why am I doing this? I'm like, I should just delete this and go to sleep. Maybe I'm just tired. Um, but I said, I'm going to keep doing it. I, and, you know, I, finished my testimony and at the bottom of the testimony I remember I wrote again in parentheses I'm like um, this doesn't make sense um, I feel like deleting all of this right now in this moment too but I said if this is God's will then may his will be done and I saw on his social media that he was going to the Philippines uh, on his next trip and don't know nothing I've never been on a missionary trip don't know nothing about it don't know what the, what they were doing there and I just said I want to go on that trip I'm going on that trip Let's talk about that. Uh, I'm curious how Pastor Tony responded to your email. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about what happened next. We'll be right back.
We are back in the studio. With me today is Louis Trinka Passat. Um, you mentioned that you wrote uh, Pastor Tony a uh, detailed message about your past and your struggles, things that you were dealing with, and uh, you had some um, uh, reservations about you know if you should do that or not. Is there anything else that um, you share with him that you'd like to share with us today? I just. Um I felt like this is on my heart to share. Um, I feel like God put me right here in this moment um, to just one thing for sure is to talk about my past, and that was my struggle with pornography. I um, I never thought in my whole life that I'd tell the world this, expose myself like this, and be vulnerable. But I feel like it's, you know, the Holy Spirit's working, and I feel like I just should say it, and I feel like there's people out there that need to hear this, but for half my life, I had struggled with that. Since I was 12 years old, 26, I had struggled with it, and I didn't, I fell upon it by accident when I was a kid, and I was so ashamed going through that, um, that I, I didn't tell anybody about it. And through my hard times and through that dark point in my life where I had gotten hurt and, you know, I'd been through relationships and I did made decisions that hurt people and that I made poor decisions on my own trying to fulfill uh, my own desires and, and get pleasures out of this world instead of focusing on God and relying on Him. And it came to light in 2016 where I finally in that dark, in those dark moments where I had shared that with my family it was one of the hardest things I had to do just sharing it right now with everybody is, is the hardest thing I think that I've done you know in my life until this point being vulnerable but I know I've been forgiven and uh, I've forgiven of my past I'm not ashamed of it and I know there's people and it's a very big problem in today's society where there's people struggling with it in our church and I just want to let it be known out there that if people are struggling with it, to come out and, and say something and to their family. And I was always scared to say something because I thought I'd be uh, uh, disgraced or, or made fun of or um, put down or abandoned by my own family. But instead, the exact opposite happened. Obviously, they were distraught and saddened by it, but our family had never come closer. We'd all prayed together, remember, that night together. We never had come closer and... and I had never been more healed in that moment, and it felt like that addiction had just gone away from my life once I had brought it to light. And and that's how God, you know, started to work, and I shared that with Pastor Tony, and I just felt called to share that with the world, and um, because I want people to know that it's they shouldn't hide this. This is so God has the power to heal people that are struggling, even with pornography or yes. whatever the situation that may think they're not able to pull out on their own. God can, but being honest and confronting your 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 uh, addictions is is probably what was was caused you to be able to break away from it. Yeah, is that is that is that what happened? Yeah, I, I, and that's I broke away with it uh, away from it, and I remember you know. Uh, I had some family that I had accountability with, and I was able to just talk about it. And um, because I always thought that this is something I can just me and God, and I can get over it on my own. But the truth was, I never did. And God had healed me, and this was the healing process. I think He was He He had to send me through football, through the NFL, through you know all my all these struggles and pains for me to come to realize that I need to rely on Him that this is not about me in this world, that I have to get on my knees and pray and uh, accept grace, accept forgiveness, and not worry about what the world's going to think, but to trust in Him, and then He's going to guide me, and He has a purpose and plan for all of this. Louis, you are very brave, and I commend you for that. Not a lot of people can do what you just did, and um, I, I'm convinced that a lot of uh, people watching this program that may be dealing with this issue uh, can see hope and they they have to um, uh, be courageous to confront whatever addiction they're dealing with uh, be it pornography drugs uh, whatever there it is sharing and getting help and getting surrounded by the loved ones is is the right thing to do um, 
God has prepared you and helped you overcome even this uh, difficult time of your life and then um, allowed you to experience um, a different level of his relationship with him on, on the missionary trip that you went on to um, Philippines. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so after I sent that email, um, remember Pastor Tony, you know, told me it wasn't a normal missionary trip. It wasn't one where we were going to go help uh, build homes. It was one where um, about eight or nine pastors were going to meet together and they were going to teach other pastors. And, you know, he, he was excited that I had shared that with him and he felt that God was calling me for something and, and working. And, um, you know, he said, if I wanted to go on a trip, I can still go. So I had bought my ticket and... Even so, I, that was in December, end of December, um, and throughout January, you know, first few weeks, he was sending emails, itineraries to the pastors, prepare for this, prepare for this, and then I was kind of like sitting there, and I was doubting again, and I was like, man, I probably shouldn't have gone on this again. I was like, eh, you know, why am I going? I'm not. You know, is this for me again? And I was in a in a place where I kept saying again, I don't know what to do next. I don't know if this is right. I don't know. And so, remember one night in January, I had a dream. I shared this with my parents before I went on the trip. Um, I was in the dream again. I was in you know, my basement talking to my brother. And that, that night we were having a conversation. And he said, why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? And I'd fallen to my knees. And I'd pounded the ground three times, really frustrated. And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And after the third time, it was almost like I, I heard God's voice. It was, almost my, it was almost myself saying it. But God knows. And I woke up crying, emotional. I remember I got on my knees and I said, God, I'm trusting in you. I don't know what's going on, but I'm, I'm going to this missionary trip to the Philippines to find my purpose in my life. And so I go on this trip. Fear of coronavirus starts spreading out. You know, nobody's on the plane. Um, typically never worried like that, you know, I, I got a mask, you know, thinking all these things, outside factors, but I just go there and there's eight pastors that I never met in my life. They never heard this testimony before. Only Pastor Tony's there that I, I know and, and um, I, I remember first night I, I go in and I meet my, my roommate, he was Pastor Abner, and there's a man from has a church, he pastors a church in Los Angeles, ironically, uh, where he grew up, you know, he was from Guatemala, and he just, he had nothing, and he transitioned, and God had always provided for him in the right timing, exact, everything he needed, the needs to get to where he got, and, you know, he planted and grew a church there. And I just felt so comfortable with this man. I, we started, she shared his testimony, and I... I, I, you know, I, I'm normally not, not like that. I'm pretty introverted. It takes me a while for me to get used to somebody comfortable with him. But me and him just kind of, you know, we, we spoke. We, we, and I really felt God working already. And the next morning, we had breakfast. And I remember Pastor Tony he passed out these bracelets. And it says, you know, something has to change. Uh, make your life count. And it was, again, it was just these little symbols, these little signs. I feel like God was just piercing my heart, speaking to me nobody realizing it there but and and i just felt like the pastors after you know i introduced myself to them i felt like they were just looking at me in a way it was like almost i felt like they were god's angels and they were just wanted to guide me and protect me there i that's how i felt i can't explain it they probably didn't feel this or or know about this and we were setting up plans what's what's going to happen during the week and we started to pray that first prayer at breakfast for for god to watch over us on our trip and i remember pastor abner just sat next to me and this man that i barely know where he put his hand on me and just started praying and we had such a powerful prayer and i felt the holy spirit and i just felt god working and and then i remember early later in that day pastor john another pastor that i met he said lewis uh god's got a plan for you he's he's going to do great things in your life didn't share anything with this man. Again, um, just moved by it because you can see, and I knew in my heart, God working. And then there was Pastor Brad. This is a man who 
had his 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 testimony is powerful, and you know he had his, his struggle with with um, alcohol, and he had a great paying job, and made a lot of money, and he gave all of that up. God had worked in his life to, and he wanted to go pastor a church, and he said, you know, he had he had anger, and and after that, he just I never and there I never seen a man so happy. He was constantly laughing, constantly worshiping Jesus, and I had a lot of anger in my heart, and that's another thing that God had broken down another wall he was breaking down and he mentions without even knowing anything about me he goes Lewis I think you already know what you want to do you just have to let God work in you and um you know again I felt God working and the next day we you know we were just we were walking around we had a little time we were, we were, we were able to see the area and now this is Pastor Shaggy and uh he goes by pastor shaggy and he's he does um illusions and i was thinking you know growing up the way i grew up really conservative i was thinking is this right this man's is like doing illusions is this really the way god wants us to do missionary work and we're walking around and he you know, he's, he just starts talking to some people. They're all interested, and, and he does he does an illusion. And in a matter of 30 seconds, and I have a video of this, in a matter of 30 seconds, there's like 40, 50 people surrounded by him. And this man is able to preach the gospel of Jesus. Remember, he did an illusion where he had Jesus in his hand, and, he, you know, Jesus rose. And that little uh, illustration, he was able to, to tell the people that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and he rose from the grave to forgive you to, for our sins. And I was like, wow, like God, God spoke to me again. He just, he was changing the way I was seeing things again, right? He was saying, who am I to judge how God works, who, how he works? Who am I to say this is how missionary work should be done? Who knows out of those 50 people, one person might have been saved. Who am I to judge? Mm. And so my mind was just changing. And, uh, you know, I said, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm just, you know what? I was like, this is awesome. What I thought this is actually this is awesome. And now this man shared his testimony with me again. Another testimony was like every pastor that was sharing their testimony with me was specifically for me. It was directed towards me. This man was an athlete. He was a great swimmer, and he wasn't Christian, you know, growing up. He wasn't close to God. And he, he, he remember, um, he went to church. It was uh, an event, and and it was about to be finished. And he remember towards the end, he was praying. He wanted God's word. He wanted God to speak to him through that pastor that was, you know, a profound pastor. And, and, and I, I believe he was like, this pastor will have a word for me. If God, if you want me to work for you, he will say something. And the service ends, nothing happens. So Pastor Shaggy's like, ah, see, and I knew it. God, you know, didn't, nothing. So, but this pastor walks through the crowd after the service through everybody and goes directly to Pastor Shaggy and uh, I believe he told Pastor Shaggy, you know, God is, is basically calling you to serve and work for him. Uh, Pastor Shaggy, wanted, he was, uh, I believe he was a swimming coach, or he, had the, he was about to be a swimming coach, and he, was gonna make, he made a lot of money doing it. And it's kind of funny, and my parallel with me is I kind of was about to go that same route. I was pursuing coaching because, again, I wanted to make a lot of money. I wanted to pursue that desire to fulfill, you know, the, the, to make the money I could have made playing football. And he gave that up to go to school to be a clown for children's ministry and to do these things. And he went, this man went around the world, goes to Iraq. Um, in the times where there was missiles flying over that country, what is, uh, not knowing any English, uh, not knowing any, uh, uh, you know, of their language, just mm -hmm. English. And somehow, some way, starts performing these illusions in front of these men. He has shown me a video and in front of these soldiers, and mm. they're just astonished. And he's preaching the gospel to these men in that time. He's able to, he can't fly out of that country. Some man takes him. They don't speak a word together. Some man directs that man, it helps him escape from that country, and he's able to fly home in safety. And that's just God working right there. And testimony after testimony, it was like God was saying, you don't believe me now? What about listen to him? You still don't believe me? Listen to him. You still don't believe me? Listen to him. And there was another man, and his name was Pastor Jeff, and his testimony, he has a mohawk. And again, we're Romanians, and just the way I was growing up in a Christian conservative church, I was like, 
I was thinking, I'll say to Romain, I was like, wait till last Ade Mohawk, you know, like, I was thinking, like, maybe shouldn't he shave it off? Like, mm -hmm. look at this man, he has a Mohawk, shouldn't he shave it off? I was like, yeah, is that right? If he's really worshiping God. Mm. And one day, this man, uh, I'm in a conference room and I go outside, I got bit by something. I go back in the room and I have a big bump on my hand and I'm just like, ah, oh, yeah, I got, I got bit. And he's like, let me pray for you. Let me pray over it. And I was thinking, like, like why? I was like, why are we uh, asking God to pray for this? Doesn't he have better things to worry about? Mm -hmm. And so he prays over it, just a quick prayer, and he goes, how great our God is. Don't you think this is so small for him? This is something, nothing for him that he can just handle. Mm -hmm. I remember he said that, and in a matter of five minutes later, it was gone. I was just like, I, I was like, I, I couldn't believe it. I started laughing, and I told him, and... He goes, hey, why don't you come to one of my classes and, and just come to my class? And I said, mm -hmm. okay. So I listened to his class, and I'll, I'll try to speed up the story. But he basically shares how, and this is where God changed my perspective again. This man, he had a mohawk. He was in a store shopping, and this, this guy goes up to him, and he goes, hey, bro, like, nice mohawk. Uh, you look like you party. Let's go, do, let's go drink and do drugs together. And Pastor Jeff goes, no, man, that's not what I do, you know. And he, he basically preaches the gospel to this man. And this man goes on to be, he's now a, a pastor at a church where he's, he's where several hundred people, I think even a thousand people, okay, from that incident. Mm. And I was just like, wow. I was like, in that moment, I was like, I will never judge anybody by how they look because who am I to judge somebody by how they look because it's God looks at their heart and not by how they look. And that's what matters most. Wow, and that's a powerful, powerful testimony. Um, we're approaching the end of, of our, our time. Um, so how did your trip end? I want to share one more, and I feel like I have to share it. Pastor Anthony Velasco, he's the senior pastor at Das Marinas Church, where there's 17,000 members, and they hold eight services from, uh, from 5.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. One day I, I go and I sit down at lunch, and Pastor Tony's like, listen to his testimony. Again, this is just how God was speaking to me. And he's, this man was a Taekwondo fighter. He was about to go to the Olympics. He was this close to going, which in comparison to me and to our society is the NFL. He got hurt, hurt his back. Basically, his career ended, devastated. And I was just like, exactly what I went through. And this man started a church with five people. It was him and his fiance at the time and three other people. For five people in 1990, and they grew it up to, to what it is now. And so Saturday night, we go and we worship. And again, Pastor Tony's preaching. I'm just a normal student learning there and and just wanting to figure out my plan with God in my life and so I go to the altar call Pastor Tony has an altar call and I go up there and I'm just worshiping God and Pastor Tony remember he, he, he calls he says he goes um, if there's anybody in the crowd tonight that wants to give up their life for Jesus call out to him and in that moment I felt that that same calling the Holy Spirit, tugging at my heart again, and the same feeling I had when I didn't go to the altar and back in, you know, at, at my church, I said, this time, I'm not going to hold back. And I, I put my hands up, and I said, I remember I called out to him, and I said, Isuse. I said, you know, in, in Romanian, it's, it's Jesus. And I thought other people were going to call out to him too, but it was almost like it was like, I, I, it was like a dead silence in the church. And I had only heard my own voice, and I knew in that moment that I'm going to give up my life to serve God, whatever He's going to call me to do. I knew I found my purpose, and that was it. And it felt like a peace had just came upon me. I was no longer afraid and held back. And I remember that night walking outside, looking in the sky, and I see the moon really bright and clouds breaking through. And I, I just felt like that was a symbolic message to, for me to God, like just God's breaking through my life. And it was mm. funny because our team in our church was breakthrough. Mm -hmm. for, and that was what I kept praying for as well in 2019. Mm -hmm. And God had broken through in my life. And so Sunday, our last day there, there's two services uh, at the main church that Pastor Tony was going to preach. All the other pastors go to satellite churches. And... Earlier in the week, uh, when they were deciding who's going to go where, I remember they came, fell on me, and they said, okay, what's Louis going to do? And I remember Pastor Tony kind of said it with, like, authority. He goes, he's going to stay with me. He's going to come with me. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, I'm, I'm going to go with him. And, and so I go with him at the 9 a.m. service. He, he preaches, you know, we pray, and I'm like, you know, feel good. We go back to the office, and we have 11, uh, the 11 a.m. service. And at the end of that service, I remember my final prayer, 
um, I knew what God's calling me to do. I knew he's calling me to serve him in, in any way that I can. And I prayed to God. I remember I was praying, God, you know, I, I, I was selling a home at the time. I'm selling a home. And uh, uh, please take this off my plate. When I get back home, find a buyer and um, I'll take this as confirmation from you that this is what you want me to do. Finish my prayer. I sit down and uh, Pastor Gigi, so this Pastor uh, Anthony Velasco's wife, Pastor Gigi walks by and she goes, can I pray for you? And I said, sure, you know, and um, she prays and, um, you know, she has a, a prophetic word for me and, um, and there's a lot, I remember I, I, I wrote it down and I don't want to share the details, all of it, because I don't want it to come off as boastful and I, and I just wanted to keep that between, you know, me and God and some people know it, but the main one of the main words and things she said in there was to be bold and courageous and that God is going to guide me every step of the way. And he called me by name, which he did back last year, you know, back through Tony Lane. And, 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 and that, you know, he has great plans and that, um, and this is confirmation, she said. She said, this is confirmation, it is confirmed. And those were the words I needed to hear in that moment. And I remember I was feeling overwhelmed and I couldn't speak for two, three hours, I remember, and the pastors were over there, at, they, were, they were with me, they were, they were kind of like asking me if they were doing okay, but they kind of knew, they kind of left me alone, I, I just, my mind couldn't comprehend what I, God had just spoken to me in that moment, and still can't comprehend what, what he's going to call me to do, and I know that what he's calling me to do is going to be extremely great, but it's going to be for his glory, and that it will not be easy, but as he's called me, and as he's just worked in my life, um, I just know that I'm going to serve him and any door that's opening where I can give him glory and praise. And this is where I am in this moment. And this is all because of this trip, guys. All because of God's calling that I'm doing this, that I'm unashamed uh, about my past and that I want to preach. I want to share the ministry in the world. And, you know, and it's funny throughout, and I don't like to use the word pastor, but that's what God is, is calling me to do. And I just, I see it more as sharing his word. And throughout the week, too, I remember everybody, you know, the students there, they kept, they saw me, they're like, oh, Pastor Lewis, you know, and I kept saying to them, oh, I'm not a pastor, and I'm not a pastor, and that's how God uh, was, was breaking down my walls as well, and, you know, the, the pastor said that's the, f the quickest way to be a pastor is by saying you're not going to be one, <laughs> and um, that's how God had worked and has worked in my life, and he's continued to work, um, and, and that's what I know my purpose is in my life, and uh, I hope that this message uh, has inspired people. I hope it will inspire people. Uh, I focus strongly, and I want our community, our church community, and not only just the Romanians, but just people across this nation. I think we're in a, a dark place, and I just want to inspire people. I feel, my, I feel called to just share this message just of unity and to really seek Jesus, and I know that I'm willing to do whatever He wants me to do, even put myself in this vulnerable position to share his gospel and I wore this hoodie specifically I know I just because I want to, to God, God be, be the, the glory. glory and I want to know I want everybody to know that never in my life did I choose to be a pastor never in my whole life that was I praying to be a pastor this is not my decision this is God's calling in my life and um, when I hear that calling I and I found my purpose is to save souls that's more important than money it's, and that's the most important thing in this world because we're going to spend eternity in heaven or hell, and I want to try to help save through Jesus Christ to save as many people as I can and share the gospel with them. And that's, and that's what I feel called to do, and I'm just so happy uh, in this moment, and I, I feel a lot of peace in my heart, and uh, I know uh, this is what I have to do. I know, and it's funny because I always said I don't know, but now I know. Thank you for sharing, uh, Louis. Um, God called you to be a disciple maker. Um, there were a couple of people uh, throughout our conversation that uh, invested in. Your brother was one of them. Pastor Tony was another. And the other pastors that you shared with, God used to help you get the direction that he wanted you to be in. He's calling you to be a disciple maker so you can actually bless, and even through this program, others that um, struggle. There are so many men struggling and hiding their, their hurt and, and their pain and their their habits and uh, their addictions and I believe God can use you greatly because your testimony is so powerful and um, you can bless and, and help a lot of men that are dealing with uh, similar issues maybe confused maybe are, are 
overwhelmed by their passion and their, their dreams and careers. Uh, God is calling us to be servants. Yes. So before anything else, he wants us to serve. And that's what we were trying to do even in this program. And I appreciate you being honest and transparent. And I look forward to seeing what God is going to do in your life. I believe great things are coming. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Uh, we'll see you next time on another edition uh, of our program, Face to Face. God bless you.